around and I open for questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Josiah here. Wow, John. Excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. I'm so happy for you and uh, what you guys are doing. I think that is, that's just awesome. It's, it's great to see. The uh, guys go ahead and ask your questions uh, in the hit the Q&A button to ask your questions and then we will ask John anything you have, any questions you have. Um, let's see here, I want to, John, do you need a break to go to the bathroom or anything before the Q&A? Uh, I'm good, I'm good. Yep. All right, perfect. So it looks like we have about 30 to 45 minutes for questions, guys. So please hit that Q&A button, ask any questions you have for John. Um, I'd like to start off with some questions. You have a lot of different animals there and in, in the, the order you shared them, is that kind of the order you went about starting with the animals or did you just get them all at the same time? <laughs> um, our philosophy was we don't really know what we wanted to, we didn't know what we were gonna like. And so we decided to get as much as we could, started really fast and then pair off what we decided didn't work or didn't fit with us. Um, I think we probably jumped in a little bit faster. Everybody says, don't move too fast when you get started on the farm, don't get started uh, too quickly. And we did it, you know, we took, I think we bit off a little too much. Um, we really got uh, the ducks and the geese and the pigs and the sheep all within about two months uh, of getting started. And we kind of expanded a little bit and cut back a little bit. What I did not realize was how hard it would be to cut back on things that we thought wasn't working. Um, and part of that is with the kids. And, you know, I guess maybe I'm a little bit more heartless. It's easier for me to say, okay, we're gonna get rid of the geese in theory but in reality, when my daughter, four-year-old daughter, has named two of the geese, it's a lot harder to actually do that. And so we do have a rule that the kids cannot name the animals that we that may be food, um, and that has worked pretty well so far. But we're still stuck a little bit trying to pare down and trying to figure out how to pare down uh, something that we're kind of a little attached to that we didn't think we would be. And you have a... You have, um, so it, it sounds like you kind of start, when you get a new animal, you're starting with a small batch to kind of learn that. Correct. Yeah. Uh, can you go through just kind of the thought process behind that? Yeah, I, I think, now, if, unless a person has a lot of experience with raising animal X or animal Y, um, even if they do, if they're in a new area, there is a sharp learning curve to figure out how to do something that's simple, like how do you set up an electric fence you know, I've never, I never did it until we moved here. You know, I, you can look at pictures and see how you do it. If you start too big, you, there, a couple things can happen. Feed cost is a big thing. Um, if you think you know how to manage your pasture land um, and you get it wrong, you can quickly run out of pasture before you uh, run out of year or run out of season. And so I, I think I highly recommend starting small with any project um, and growing into it if it fits well uh, in your context, in your, for your lifestyle or whatever you're doing. Um, and so, yeah, with our pigs, we actually started with two. With our, um, the geese and ducks were a little bit different. We never, we did not expand. We started small, never grew with them. The layers, we started with about 20 and now we're about 80. The sheep, we started with nine and now we're after the after this last breeding season, we're you know in the in the low twenties. Um, but what that also does is it lets you learn how much your land can hold with the management style that you're doing. So for us, practicing this holistic management, we don't want to give any extra hay. We gave almost no hay to our sheep for, and we've had enough for a full year. Almost no hay to them for a whole year, um, which is really good. But that's because. We had more land than we did sheep that needed the land. And um, if you do the opposite, you're gonna have to shell out a lot of money um, to keep them around, or you're gonna have to get rid of them, maybe animals that you didn't wanna get rid of. And so go slow and, uh, and uh, start small. And it will, and that's permaculture principle, you know, small and slow solutions. Um, there's, there's a lot of wisdom behind that. 
Now I'd like to dig a little into finances um, and how all of that works for you. So are you guys getting outside income into the farm or is there a certain amount of money you started with to your initial investment? What, what were the kind of financials behind this? Yeah, and, and that's a that's a, a really good question. And, and it's one that um, I have no problem answering at all, but everybody has to realize and find what is their unfair advantage? Um, some people have an unfair advantage because they've got family land that they can use. I've got a neighbor um, who's doing that right now. He's got a small farm and he's not paying rent or anything. He's got that land for free. Like, man, that's, you know, that's unfair. But he looks at me and says, man, you've got a really good job on the outside um, as, a, as an ER physician that is funding this product, this project until we start to become self-sufficient. Um, but I also at the same time have got four kids and had to buy a farm from, from scratch. Um, everybody has an unfair advantage and everybody has unfair disadvantages. And so um, for us, and unfortunately, I think this next generation of people that are trying to get into farming are really stuck with the financial issue. Most people have to have an off farm job um, to start and I would recommend doing that. I would recommend not jumping into it 100% until you actually have some revenue streams moving forward. Now, and we've only been doing this for you know under a year and a half, I could say, you know what, on our land, if we wanted to, I could um, expand our, our turkeys and our broiler production. And if we way cut back on our lifestyle. If I didn't have four kids also, that would probably help some. But uh, I could I could make, a, really come close to making ends meet, but it would be a full-time endeavor for me to do that. Um, and there's no resilience. I mean, there, there's, no, there's no backup with that. Uh, and so this is why I say, again, start small, go slow, grow into it. One of, one of the most successful um, grass farmers that I know I should say grass, grass, grass raised beef is Greg Judy. He did not quit his part-time job until he had hit off his farm and had um, was leasing multiple farms to run his cattle. Um, he could have cut it. He could have quit his other job years before, but that wasn't what he wanted to do. He wanted he wanted to kind of keep that back up just as a buffer. Um, and so again, it's it's context. You know, if you're young and you want to live on a in a tent while you're getting your your farm going, which I think is awesome. I think 20 years ago I would have done that. Um, now I can't quite do that. Is it possible? Yeah, it's a lot more. It's a lot less feasible though. Oh yeah, especially with the wife and kids. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta keep everybody happy. Yeah. Uh, you has that's excellent advice and um one of my favorite pieces of advice you gave or a piece of advice you gave was the first year to do nothing permanent uh, i've seen a lot of people wish that they would have done that uh, i wish i would have done that and in the beginning as well especially um especially if it's a new piece of property if you're getting into a new piece of property and it's your first year, you definitely don't want to go to anything permanent, um, especially when you're doing design. If you've taken a PDC or anything like that, or if you're going to focus a lot on design, <clears throat> you definitely don't want to do anything permanent for that first year because you need time to observe. You need to know what works and what doesn't work before you start implementing permanent systems. And so just excellent advice there. And I'll just expand a little bit on that. I, I mean, I had a PVC. I had been studying about studying permaculture for probably uh, a, a decade, writing about permaculture for five years, setting up lots of small, like a little place because of the military, I was moving a lot. Um, and I still, even with all this background information, I still took a year to do, you know, any big land work projects. And I'm so thankful I did because there's, there's permanence to that. You know, you, you can't, un it's very hard to undo those things. Yeah, definitely. That's the, and, and you don't know if you want those systems to be permanent. Yeah. In the future and to undo them is just not going to, it's not uh, greatly feasible. Yeah. Because you got to look at like you're doing the uh, mob grazing and rotations. Well, if you start putting ponds right where you need 
um, animals to graze or things to be set up for that, you run into issues. And that's, there's so many instances or examples of that. The, uh, the next question I had was the finance, uh, but again, on the financing side, if I'm new getting into this and um, I want to start making some money, it sounds like the bro broilers and turkeys might be my best two options to start with. Is that kind of what you're thinking? And what is the cost? What, what's my startup cost of those? Yeah, so um, there, I think there's, there's, a, there's a couple uh, answers to that. The, if you can get scrap wood, if you can get scrap metal, you can, you can rig together uh, these chicken tractors uh, very, very inexpensively. Um, if you build them yourself, they're going to be, you know, probably two to three hundred dollars a chicken tractor. Maybe double that, depending on your source of wood and materials. The chickens, when you purchase that many, you can get them for, you know, under two dollars uh, a bird. Um, and then you got to, like I said, you go go slow, start small, do one batch of a hundred, and see where your uh, what your price point is for selling, what your market's going to allow. I mean, if you decide, man, I, I want to make $50,000 doing chickens and you raise that many, if you don't have it developed your market, you're, you're hosed, you're, you know, you're out of freezer space. You don't have any you know, room to put them. Uh, you'll be eating a lot of chicken. <laughs> and um, uh, the other is the processing equipment. This, that processing equipment is expensive. Um, <clears throat> And there's a couple options with that also. You can rent them, Featherman, uh, which is the equipment that I have. They actually have a website and they have rentals available for, I mean, they're all over the country, you can rent them. Um, that's one option for renting the equipment to cut your costs. Uh, the uh, turkeys are more expensive per bird and they're a longer investment. Uh, they take, you know, we process them at about 18 weeks, I think, um, which is versus eight weeks. You know, it's more than, more than double, almost triple because you can actually grow them. Some people wait till about 20 weeks to process them. Um, and the feed costs, um, you know, you're, if you're getting really high quality organic feed, you're looking at $30 per 50, uh, 50 pound bag. And um, you're, you know, we, I think we had our really good run, we had about three and a half pounds of feed per pound of bird raised. And so um, you, you start kind of running the numbers with your area that you have, and you can kind of start to get some end, uh, end numbers with where you think you could end up making. Uh, it, again, it kind of, it, it, there's a lot of variables with that. I think that's one that a person can grow up and expand pretty fast. Um, if you have no desire to, to do all the processing uh, of, the, of the birds, which is a lot of work, um, I, I would recommend Greg Judy's books, Risk-Free Ranching, which um, he, um, and I didn't talk about this, but we had him come out here for a conference last year. Uh, it was a two-day conference, uh, which was fantastic. And he, he really spoke about how he, without owning land and without owning cattle, uh, was able to pay off his own farm in three years uh, by, and his only investment was time and uh, the poly grade wire, some charging units, and um, I think a course that he took um, with, uh, oh, I can't think of his name right now. It, it all come to me, but uh, a course on holistic management, basically. And so that had even less investment, but it has a lot of time. And so you got to figure out what you have more freely available. Figure that out and then move forward with what you think is going to be able to make money for you. Um, and take a chance, um, but take small, take enough the chance that you can afford the loss if the risk goes south <laughs> is what I recommend. Yeah, and I think that goes a lot into uh, into marketing as well. So for the first year, did you kind of take the the uh, the way of of uh, marketing by just planning your first one or two uh, your one or two crops 
gosh, I'm having a blank on words. Uh, you, your, I'm sorry, your runs, um, like your runs on animals, are you giving those away for marketing just to kind of get people to try the meat? No, you know, we didn't. Um, like, again, our first goal was to raise food for ourselves. Um, and if we, we decided that, you know, we're going we're gonna to probably have some extra here. And we were worried about freezer space before we picked up a bunch of used freezers. And these were beat up freezers we got for very cheap off of, you know, Craigslist and eBay or, um, um, you know, Facebook pages. But <clears throat> the, uh, we decided that we're going to sell the birds for what we, uh, what we think they're worth within reason and, and start with that. And we very quickly, there are people that are looking for this, this type of food. Um, there are people that are looking to know who is raising the food, to actually come out and see them. Um, the good news is that I think the United States is in this food revolution a little bit. They want, they want to know more about their food. They want to know where it comes from and how it was raised. And there are people that are looking, even in areas that you don't think that they would be. Um, you just got to find a few customers to start. And man, by word of mouth, it, it grows. Uh, we definitely used, um, you know, Facebook, um, mainly Facebook, and and I think that was it. That was pretty much it. And then word, it was all word of mouth. It very, it spread very quickly. Um, and like I said, you know, we're not raising a lot of chickens at this point. Um, you know, this this last year we only raised 300. That's not a lot, but we we've got waiting lists for people. We um, only raised 50 turkeys this last year. Um, we are going to run out very quickly. And so this is, this, we're still in that test phase, I think, um, of learning our systems ourselves, learning how to process ourselves and building a, a market that we're actually growing into. The good news is that our market is growing faster than we are, which is where you want to be. You don't want to have your, your too much product and not enough market. You want to have more market so that there's more demand. Um, and then people don't feel bad um, and you don't feel bad charging what you actually deserve for that work um, because you're like, well, look, if you don't want it, I've got three other people that are looking to buy it and not in a bad way, not to be like a jerk or to be, you know, hard pressure sales, but like this is actually quality food that you will not find this in the store uh, without paying probably five times as much. And so, um, you know, have pride in what you do. Don't be apologetic at all. And the good, the customers that you want will stick around. Excellent advice. Yeah, and that falls uh, into Katie's question, which is, and, and you answered a great deal of it, but how do you sell locally? Do you use CSAs or farm stores, or are you just going word of mouth and Facebook? Yeah, so um, for the most part, we did word of mouth and Facebook. There is one, um, we have one CSA that just started in our area um, that is run by a very um, experienced person. She just moved here from, I think, New Mexico. and. Um, she has a you know, 20 year history or something like that of running CSA. So she knows what she's doing. She knows that she's already getting fine people. I, I didn't even know that we're like, like a mile away from me. They're raising good quality food um, to get into the CSA. And we're just trying, we're starting to do a little bit of work with her. You got to find out what's in your area, find out who's running CSAs, if there are any, um, see what what gaps they have in the products that they that they have also and i didn't really say this in in my presentation but <clears throat> our goals if you saw our four goals there wasn't hey i'm going to raise this breed of heritage pig or i'm going to raise this sheep my goal was i want to raise quality food and see if we can sell it you got to find out what you can sell that's out there and then work on that niche if you go in there with i'm only going to do this one thing you could very easily uh, fail at that because what we're doing is we're using the animals to, to fix our soil. Um, what that animal is could be a sheep, it could be a goat, it could be a pig, it could be a chicken. Um, and so you got to be a little uh, versatile or um, uh, flexible in what you're doing. Excellent. All right, next question is from Mitchell, or is it Michelle? Sorry. <laughs> The uh, question is, what do you do with all the chicken bones after you've made your broth? Um, so you can make you can make broth a couple different ways, um, and we do. Um, the broth that we 
we get a really, really slow, slow simmer. We never let the heat go up too high. We never cook it for too long. And you get a really thick gelatin rich broth, which if you put it in the refrigerator gels, it's like almost like a big bowl of jelly. <clears throat> um, you can add more stuff to that, or you can just the first time through crank the heat up high and cook it. And sometimes I'll cook the broth for three, four, five days. Those bones completely crumble. They get mixed in with any of the meat that's left over on there. And we feed those to the pigs and they go crazy on them. Uh, and again, like I said, the bones completely crumble. Um, you squeeze them and they're just, they're not, I'm trying to think of what they're kind of like, they're kind of like, you know, an Oreo cookie. It just crumbles like that. Um, and these are the big, uh, either sheep or chicken bones. And so there's a lot of mineral that's still left in there. And so that's great food for the pigs. All right. Uh, next question is an anonymous question, but how much land would you say is required for your operation? Uh, for what you have right now, how much land would be required for someone starting out? For what we are doing, um, under 30 acres for sure. Um, you can probably, if you're a little bit more, depending on, again, it all depends. Um, but if you had um, pretty flat, decent quality pasture land, you could do this on 15 to 20 acres. Um, uh, we have almost 100, but 60 of it is woods that's really steep. Uh, probably half of the wooded areas are uh, almost, you almost have, a, have to have a rope to climb it. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of trees there. And so, um, but we haven't, we've almost not at all accessed or um, tapped into the resource of the woods for us. We've almost done everything just with the pasture. And you take away the roads, you take away the, the ponds, you take away some of the, the really worn out areas from the cattle that were there previously. And we're probably only working on about 25, 30 acres. Um, and if it was more flat area that had a little that are the you saw the pictures of those hills, some of those hills, I mean, we have, you know, maybe a half inch of you know, soil uh, before it hits the, the subsoil rock. If you actually had some decent land, you could do this easily on 20 acres. All right. And as far as the animals go, which ones are your favorites? Now, that that I think is a two-parter. One would be favorite as far as your enjoyment and actually liking working with these animals. And the other one is is the best animals for um, uh, money, to, yeah. for profitability. I think it depends on the day. Um, when the sheep get out, which they did earlier today, the ewes, for whatever reason, decided, I'm not sure what happened, but they all busted through. And what they do, they always do this, is they bust out, if they bust out, and they go straight down to the area that we first ran chicken, because that area is thick green grass, and this whole area is, you know, we're in a drought. Um, when that happens, they're my least favorite animal. And then when, they're, when we're moving them, and we move them to a fresh paddock, and we see them run in there and start hopping and skipping, and they really do. It's like they buck. They're so happy to get into a new paddock and they're so excited. I'm like, oh, the sheep are my favorite animal. Um, and uh, the, uh, the pigs, even though we haven't even processed a single pig yet, um, the idea, I'm, I'm a big foodie. I, I'm a, you know, amateur chef type. <laughs> and the, the possibilities of all the stuff that I can do with the pork that we're going to end up having um, is really, really exciting to me. Um, seeing the work that they do um, to prepare the garden with those noses, I mean, tilling up this this rock um, makes it really exciting with those pigs. But then, you know, I'm like, okay, we don't have any baby pigs yet, and we're still having to, you know, get feed for them. So that gets a little frustrating. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big animal person, so my favorite animal, personally, it depends on the day. Profitability, the the... I think the broilers are going to be where the money is at for a small farm that doesn't want to put a lot of investment in that has time on their hands. Um, that's where it's going to be. Um, you have a fat, I mean, it's eight week return. Um, you know, you get the chickens, you process them at uh, eight weeks, you can sell them that day to the next, within that next week. And um, your return of investment and cash flow is there. And so that, from a financial perspective, that's where it's at. Yeah, that's what, what I've found too, is boilers are, are definitely a great way to start. And I found that the most expensive part of raising boilers is the feed and the processing. 
yeah. equipment. And so if you can find a rental, like a mobile processing, because in West Virginia, there was a guy that was, he just has a mobile trailer with all the processing equipment, he comes to your farm, processes everything. And even if you could do that as a business as well, if you have to buy the equipment, maybe you could make that a, a business as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so falling in line with the sheep and with the pigs, uh, MJ has the question of, do you butcher the sheep yourself or do you use a local butcher? And I would ask the same question of the pigs, what your plan is. Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> for, um, if you're gonna be reselling um, poultry, you can process yourself depending on your state, under the um, small farm exemption. USDA has, a, has a, this organic exemption, um, but if, you're gonna, if you have under 20,000 birds, a lot, of, a lot of states fall under that. And then there's even the, the ultra small processor, and they, I can't remember if it's 1,000 or 500 birds or something like that, you can process yourself. Um, when it comes to poultry, I think if you can process yourself, you're gonna be saving yourself a lot of money. Your, your margin, of profit is not huge and if you're suddenly paying one or two dollars per bird for processing your 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 profit is going to be is going to drop fast um, animals that we're going to eat ourselves i'm processing i personally um, and that's for two reasons um, we bought a, a, a cow from a neighbor who was doing grass-fed beef um, it was a pretty good uh, animal um, I showed up, I, you know, I gave my cut sheet, I told them what I wanted, I showed up, you know, the, the time when I was supposed to pick it up, and uh, I got most of the cuts that I requested, but none of the organ meat, which is what I wanted. And they're like, oh, well, hang on a second, I'll go get you, I've got some liver back there. I'm like, no, wait a minute, <laughs> there's a huge difference. I specifically wanted that animal, and the, the way that animal was raised is that food that I want. I don't want some, I also have another neighbor, um, well, I should say when we first bought the place, there was they were running cattle here, and the the neighbor who was running his cattle on our land asked if we could leave the cattle there just until the end of that season, uh, because he didn't have any place for them. And you know we're new to the area, definitely didn't want to make enemies with a with a new neighbor. And I was like, yeah, you know, no problem. Well, he showed up one day with a five gallon bucket of uh, a mineral block, and I was like, oh, he's giving a mineral block. I smell it, it smelled like like gas, like gasoline. He's like, oh yeah, I soaked this in diesel fuel overnight and then let it dry out and give it to my cattle. It cures the pink eye. And I was, wow. And so his cattle, you know, at the end of the season, he took them to the um, to the cattle uh, barn and sold them. To, and, uh, you know, they're in our feed supply. I have no idea what that does to an animal, what that does to the meat and to the organs that you could potentially consume, but I don't want that. <laughs> and so um, I'm going to process this. So that's part of it. The other part is just ethically. If I'm going to be raising animals this way, I want to, um, I want to take their life myself and not everybody does that. And I get it. Not everybody's going to be equipped to handle a whole pig or a whole sheep or a whole cow if we get to that. Um, legally, though, if you're going to sell the animal, you can't process it yourself if it's a large mammal. Um, you have to uh, take it to a proper USDA uh, or at least a state inspected that's not going to cross state lines processing facility um, if you're going to resell it. There are some kind of funny workarounds, but usually you still have to get it processed at a USDA approved or a state approved facility. And that's if you're selling across state lines. Some states inside the state line, you can, you can process your own. No, yeah, you can process your own, um, but again, you got, I, I don't know, I, I only know this state, and I still, there's still a lot of confusion. They're not, it's not very bad, but because I figured out most of it, but there's a few gray areas, and I'm not going to ask, because I, if you ask, you're going to get an immediate, well, no, you can't do that, even if that's not the correct answer, because it's easier for them, um, and then it puts you on their radar. <laughs> And uh, as Joel Salatin has a book, you know, everything I want to do is illegal. There's a reason he wrote that book because there's so many things that he's doing that's higher quality that is now he can't do because of some law or restriction because he's on the radar. Yeah, yeah, it's a tragedy that the, the laws and government behind but it just affects local farmers a great deal. Anyway, next yeah. question <laughs> is um, Daniel, and he says, any tips for butchering the ducks? I've heard that plucking can be very difficult. You touched on that a little bit, but could you 
yeah, I, I hate um, butchering my ducks and geese. Um, it is a miserable experience. Um, and and I, I have to think that there's, that there's, here's what I think. When I raise, um, when we raise our Cornish Rock cross broiler chickens, they are so easy to process. Um, their feathers come off like, like nothing else. They're beautiful carcasses. Um, they're, it's, it's an, it is a dream compared to the roosters that we process. You know, every time we process now, we usually have um, some local neighbors that bring some of their own animals to process. They help us out in the morning. We process their birds last. And there is such a difference between old hens and uh, roosters. And I think it's more than just their age. I actually think it is their, their breed. Um, I think if I got a really um, a high production meat breed duck, it would actually be a whole lot easier to clean. I haven't, I haven't tested that out yet, but I think that that's probably going to contribute. Uh, but I've tried dry plucking, wet plucking. I tried them dropping them in the um, scalder. I tried dropping them in the scalder multiple times. I mean, in the, in the plucker multiple times, scalding them again, putting them in the plucker. Um, I've tried hot wax dips. I've tried all the variations um, that I can come up with. And I really tried. I mean, I like made a list of all the different ways to do it. And I went through and I did it each bird differently. None of them worked well. Um, I ended up having to sit there with tweezers and pull out all the dark feathers um, or any feathers that were stuck. And I still ended up with just not good um, looking carcasses. Nothing like you get when you go to the store. <clears throat> and so I know that they figured out how to do it. I just don't know how to do it yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember, our first presentation was with Jack Spirico, who's raising ducks, and, and I think he covered processing. I ta I've talked to Jack about it. What he does is he um, he skins them, takes the breasts, and that's it. He, I, don't, I don't think he's actually doing um, um, anything else with them. Um, and I get it. I totally get it. But I will say this, the, especially with how we're raising our ducks and our geese, that fat from them is so... Good. It is. It is this. You know, it's this golden liquid gold, is what I say. And so, what I end up doing is I still process the best that I can, and I end up with uh, even if there's a lot of little pin feathers that are not aesthetically nice for you know for roasting a bird, I'll still skin them, save the skin, and render that down and get all the fat out of it, and then use that fat for cooking. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, next question is from Mark. Mark asks, with the pigs, and I would ask with the sheep as well. Are you going to be breeding them, or are you just buying wieners? No. Well, so my goal is to breed um, all of them. Um, we may actually do that with some cattle in the future because I, this the way our land is with all the hills, it's not set up for large large scale uh, cattle. But we've got a ram. We have a friend who has some Katabi hair sheep that are raising them almost identical to us now, and they had a ram and they needed to get the ram away because they didn't have fencing for it and. Fortunately, we needed a ram at that time, and so he's he was the sire for our first uh, lambing, and then we ended up going up to Virginia and buying a lamb, a ram, um, who was also from a farm. And this is I started to learn, <laughs> you know, how do you raise your animals? Do you do any chemical? You know, do you give any medicines? Do you do any vaccines? Do you you know are they on grass? Do you do any supplemental feed? And I mean, I was on the phone with her for you know an hour. And she was like, after, at the end of the conversation, she said, I am so excited about somebody like you buying an animal for me because you're doing what I'm doing, you know? And, uh, and he's a great looking ram, um, but you know, he's unproven. And so we paid a lot less for him. So we'll see if he does the job. Um, so, and same thing with the pigs. Um, we bought um, a, an unproven Gloucester old spot boar. Um, you know, he was just, eight weeks old or so when we got him and he has grown miserably. And so he is going to go, he's going to be processed when we probably, we got a couple wiener pigs um, as well. Um, or, you know, that we're growing out their castrated males and they're, they're good looking pigs now. And so we'll process them and we'll process that, that uh, boar, um, wait for a few months to make sure that he didn't actually uh, father or sire any of the females that we have running with them. And then we'll get a new board that's actually that I, I can take a look at a little bit better and, and test it out. 
Yeah, yeah. Once again, it goes back to the observing first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, in a similar question, Mark asks, "Why do you think it was not needed to dock the sheep, uh, the sheep tails, and why do you not neuter the immature rams?" Mm -hmm. So there's two reasons. Um, <clears throat> the the katahdins do not need to be docked. Um, that's one of the nice things about them. Um, I there I think there may be some people who dock katahdin, but I most people do not. They just don't have the issues. Um, with the manure caking on them. They don't have the fly, the maggot infestations. Um, they just, they don't have the problems that require docking, which is a, another big reason I like the Katahdins. Now, I mean, and this is kind of a side thing, as, as a physician, as an ER physician, I have no problem doing any of those kind of procedures. Um, I know some people are like, oh man, I, you know, I could never do that. I wouldn't have an issue trying that at all, even though I've never done it. Um, with the with the ram lambs, uh, we chose also not to because I don't know who I'm going to sell them to. You know, we're not doing ear tags. Uh, we're not castrating because if um, certain ethnic markets want an intact animal in every sense, um, they don't want to have any blemish or any anything surgically removed. And um, I also do think that lets them kind of grow a little bit better. Um, and there's some back and forth with that. Uh, <clears throat> And so we'll see, you know, this is the first year that we have ram lambs and right now, you know, they are, I've been trying to keep them without being in eyesight with these hills, it's not too bad, but for the last eight, uh, uh, no, it's like eight weeks, um, last three weeks, they've been able, they've been up high on a ridge and they've been able to look down and see the females and they haven't even tried to get out of their fence, um, you know, the, and I've seen a lot of, or heard a lot of animals that will bust right through an electric fence to get to the females if they wanted to. And so far, either they just haven't figured out that they can do that, or, you know, um, it's not as big of an issue, at least for us right now. All right. Next question comes from Josh. Josh, Josh asks, where is the best source of temporary fencing supplies and what kind of information specific to running sheep and hogs together would you give to someone looking to start a pasture raised meat operation? Um, Chem Cove has really good equipment. Um, I kind of make sure uh, Premier One has good equipment. Uh, PowerFlex has good equipment. Um, those are the three companies that I use. Um, and that's, that's basically based on a lot of recommendations from other people who were doing this before me. And so I, I can't say that I've tested out all these other things, but I've let, what I'm doing is I've, I've let other people do all the testing and I'm, I'm gleaning their, uh, their research, uh, which was freely given, you know, just like what I'm trying to do here. Um, I don't know for sure if I needed to remove my pigs from my sheep, even during landing season. I don't know that I needed to do that. Um, we chose to do that just because I wasn't sure. Um, Breed selection makes a huge difference. Our heritage pigs are, are, they're just relaxed. You know, they're not, they're not anything like the industrial model commercial pigs that are out there. I mean, I've got a neighbor who, you know, who raised a 600 pound uh, pig in an area about eight by eight for its entire life. This thing was huge and would, I mean, the walls had to be reinforced. This thing was mean, it, it scared me. And I'm like, that is not the kind of animal I want to have on my farm with my little kids here. And so um, our chickens, when, we, when we've had our chickens, our layers run, um, you know, randomly in the, uh, in the egg mobile and the guineas, they will hop right in with the pigs and eat. You know, they'll even jump on their backs and, and try to pick uh, uh, bugs off of them. And they don't do anything with them at all. Now, that same day, if I have a, ch a chicken that got run over in the a chicken tractor, um, and I know, oh, it just got killed, or it just died, I'll take that dead chicken and throw it in the pigs, and they go crazy on it. I mean, they'll rip that thing to pieces, and that's a, I mean, that's good. Pigs are omnivores, and that's a good meat product for them. Um, again, these pigs right now, I'm not, I'm not selling. These are just animals for ourselves, so I don't know if that would actually be I haven't looked in to see if something like that would be allowed for <laughs> for um, 
uh, if we were going to sell these pigs. But um, so it's really interesting. If the animal's dead, if the chicken is dead, they go for it. But they can have that same. Uh, they can have a chicken walk right next to it, and that they just kind of push it away with their nose and, and move along. Um, and so the only reason we decided to move the chickens from the or I'm sorry the the pigs from the sheep was because we I didn't want to lose any of our first lambs if one of those pigs decided hey wait a minute that smells like maybe I can eat it yeah we got territorial yeah all right next question is from Brian Brian asked did you happen to mention how many acres the farm is I believe you said it was 110 about it's, and, it's, right, it's right under 100 and it's about 60 acres are wooded and about 40 acres are pasture. Okay, and and with the uh, wooded, are you using any of that for, for the pigs yet or you're about to? I'm about to, I'm about to, yeah. Um, we've got, um, I'm hoping at the end of this, by the end of this month, I'm gonna have um, some some lanes cut that I can uh, put the, the uh, just the temporary wire, the same, the same fencing that I used with the sheep, just one strand. Um, I'll probably do two up in the woods just to make sure. Um, the, the really good news, and this is again an unfair advantage that we have, um, you just have to take into account, is that we have almost no predators on our property because this property used to be a coyote hunting farm. And it has um, about six foot woven wire fence, you know, about a one inch woven wire fence all around the entire perimeter of the property. I can't imagine how much that costs. I mean, Twenty-five, thirty thousand uh, dollars to do that, um, but it was done before we bought the place, um, which was a, a nice bonus for buying this place. But <clears throat> so, if I didn't know if there were predators, I'd put I'd I'd do a much better fencing up there for the pigs. Uh, or if you just didn't have predators, but a lot of places have coyotes, and coyotes go after piglets for sure. And the the main thing to or the one of the uh, main things to think about when you're raising pigs inside of a tree line is the slope and and the wetness right yeah yeah so we've got some real steep areas that if we let the pigs go and they'd go up and down it but they would do a lot of damage really fast and so what we're doing is we're going to keep them in the bottom land um, in the valley areas um, when it's dry and we're going to keep them up on the ridge tops when it's when it's wet um, and we're, we're really probably not going to let them into that middle ground uh, where it's real heavily sloped. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the plan. We're going to basically do these teardrop shaped uh, paddocks that go up. On, we've got like seven different ridge line. You know, it's like my wife always says, you know, it's like a you know, classic hand shaped or, you know, um, back of the hand shaped ridge uh, property. And so, yeah, on all the ridges, we'll put paddocks up there for the winter which is our wet season, uh, where we'll keep the pigs up there. Yeah, uh, what we found in West Virginia was we just kept them off the slope during the wet seasons, and we they were fine on the slope during the dry season. Yeah, you know, there's, I, I'm not, you know, again, I haven't done that yet, um, so I'm not sure, and I will probably trial some and kind of watch and really keep a close eye on what the impact is on the land, make sure it's not, they're not causing too much erosion. We moved them a, a lot, like every day. Because yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's that's the thing, um, you know. And, and this is something I still don't know. I I know we've got some very poisonous mushrooms here. Um, I just don't know if, if the pigs are going to be affected by them. You know, we've got you know the um, destroying angel mushrooms. I, that's something I have to look at. And we, we don't have a ton of them, but we've got we've got a lot of mushrooms up in the woods. A lot of them are edible uh, for humans. I, I don't. I just don't know yet with the pigs how they're going to handle that, or if it's going to be an issue or not. I think the main concern would be whether they were forced to eat them or not. I think they would ignore them unless they were in the area too long and that was what they had to eat. You know, if they have something else they favorite that they already know they like, they'll go for that, I would imagine. Yeah. Next question comes from Angelita. And Angelita asks, what was wrong with the land before you started the restoration? So, yeah, great question. Um, this was open grazed cattle uh, with cattle for I'm guessing at least 20 years, um, probably more than that. When I say open graze, what they did was, you know, they may have kept one large perimeter fence, maybe one fence between the, the two sides of the farm. But what happens is when you open graze pasture, 
uh, cattle or sheep, they we always say they eat dessert first. They'll go after, a, let's say, a clover plant. They'll go after red clover first. They eat that plant, and the only thing that's going to let that plant grow back is the reserve nutrients that are uh, reserve energy in the root system. They'll eat that plant, and then they go and they eat every other plant that they can find that's something that they like. In the meantime, that plant's regrowing. In four to seven days, it starts to regrow from the energy stores that it has because it has no photosynthetic ability anymore. That plant grows up, and nothing that a, a, a cow doesn't like anything more than that clover, than a young tender clover, and so it goes and eats it again. That plant now is beaten down again, and it might have enough energy stores to do that two, maybe three times before it just doesn't have any energy left in its roots, and it, and it um, uh, that plant dies. In the meantime, the plant that's right next to it, the plant that the cow just doesn't really like, in our case, the broom sedge, grows up bigger and bigger and bigger, and then drops seed, and now it drops seed into the area where that clover was, bare ground that it grows right into, and it expands. And so our entire area had um, has lost a lot of high quality forage plants. We do have good diversity, and that's what I love about this area is it's very um, genetically diverse when it comes to plants, but very overgrazed and evidence of overgrazing, a lot of evidence of compaction because they left too many cows on the area for too long, and um, a lot of erosion from them walking the same paths every time. We've got cattle tracks, cattle paths everywhere along the sides of the, um, the ponds. They just destroyed the sides of the ponds, so there's no life there. Um, and a lot of the areas on the, on the slopes where the, where the hills are a lot steeper, um, they've just eroded the soil so much that, you know, we either have big rocky patches or soil that's only, you know, less than a half inch thick. Uh, before it hits the, the subsoil rock. Um, and then on top of that, we had, like I said, those thousands of eastern red cedar saplings that were anywhere from, you know, a foot to five feet tall um, all over. And those plants uh, drop their needles, which create an area of dead grass around them. So we had all these circles of dead grass everywhere. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of stuff to overcome. And most places are going to have um, areas that have something like that that you have to overcome. Um, and if you don't, a lot of times the land price is, is more expensive because it's better quality soil. But we can overcome that. You know, we can, we can fix that and sometimes very quickly with proper management. Yeah, and that's what I was just gonna, that's what I was just gonna say. You'd be amazed how quickly we can repair those using the system. Yeah. Uh, Tracy asked, any reason you don't raise rabbits or have you thought of using, raising rabbits? Yeah, we are really interested in raising rabbits. It's just another endeavor we haven't done yet. <laughs> I mean, we've got a lot, a lot on our plate. I think if I decided, if I told my wife, hey, I'm thinking I might want to do rabbits. She's actually, we're both actually interested in it. And the, actually, if you're looking for a avenue to sell, um, selling rabbits online for dog food, there's a you know, booming trend right now for the um, you know, whole, animal feed, I can't remember what the term is for, for dog feed, but basically people are selling whole rabbits. They butcher them and bleed them out and they wrap them in a freezer bag and put them in a box and ship them to people. And it's not, it's not human food, so there's so much less um, restriction. Um, I think there's a huge market for that. I personally like to eat rabbit. I think it's a really good quality meat. Uh, they reproduce really fast. Um, it's just something we haven't jumped into yet. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, with the, especially with the dogs, that's a great market. And I see that a lot of people, especially around where I'm at, there's a lot of hunting and people get really excited for the hunting season so they can get scraps to create their own dog food. There's a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see, next question is from Tracy. And Tracy asks uh, that you, you, in the, in the presentation um, title or description, you mentioned raising dogs, and we saw a picture of a dog. You yeah. protein dogs. Do you have those, or are you planning on those? No, you know what? Um, we're, we're not. We're not truly raising dogs. It's more a matter of that we have dogs here. We had a we had a Dalmatian um, that that stayed with us for um, you know years ago. We were told we couldn't have kids, and so 
So I got my wife this Dalmatian puppy. Dalmatians are really high energy, love to run. My wife was a college athlete, and so she she liked to run. And, and uh, a year after we got him, we started having kids and um, ended up having four kids. But he ended up traveling with us to all three continents with us, got us here to the farm, um, and got it, honestly the way my wife says it, he got us here settled on the farm, um, and then he got a, a probably a liver cancer and died very quickly. And so. Um, yeah, that was kind of a, a definitely a sad thing. That we um, very quickly knew that we needed uh, some more dogs. Not, you know, safety. You know, companionship uh, is a big thing. We ended up getting two uh, Australian Shepherd puppies, not related to male and female, that we may uh, decide to breed. We're not sure about that yet. Yeah, and I imagine a lot of that's going to depend on how well they do on the farm with the animals. Exactly. Exactly. They're smart. Oh my goodness, they're smart. Some of the smartest dogs I've ever seen, though. Uh, next question is from Katie. Katie asks, "Do you plan? Do you have plans to transition into silvopasture?" Yes, and that's what those. That's what the swale. Um, the swale is kind of the first step in that direction. Um, our idea is, you know, the the most um, productive system on dry land is going to be a savanna on in the planet. Um, you know, you got the the tide pools, and then you've got coral reefs, and then you've got savannas, and it's that filtered sunlight where the canopies of the trees don't touch, um, that get all the way down, that allow grass and undergrowth to grow, allows the tree to grow. The upwards pasture, or I'm, I'm sorry, the upward growth of that tree is huge. Um, I don't really plan on doing, um, you know, any row crops. Um, that's just not, I don't have the time to do that with, with my off-farm job. Um, but we will definitely be doing the agroforestry kind of stuff, probably thinning out the 60 acres of woods, improving that, not for, honestly, not much for lumber, but mainly for the, um, the nut trees and the fruit trees that are naturally there. And we got a lot. We got a lot of mulberries. We got pawpaws. We got the walnut, the hickory, the, the lots of different species of oak. Um, and then we've got some, just a couple really big, beautiful maple trees um, that that we will, that I'd actually like to maybe even tap, even though they're not the sugar maple. Uh, open up the woods a little bit, get the trees planted down here with the chestnut. We actually, one of the neighbors right here still has an American chestnut, a true 100% American chestnut. Um, if you know anything about that, you know, I, I was like, yeah, whatever, they're all, you know, it's a hybrid. She's like, no, you know, I don't think so. The University of Kentucky, uh, Tennessee came out with their botanist and did some tests and they said, yeah, it is. So they're actually taking samples of those nuts to try to propagate um, disease or pesters, um, fungal light resistant trees. Um, so I'm a huge fan of silver pasture. We plan on doing it, but it takes time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, for those that don't know, there was a huge culling of chestnuts and that's why it's a big deal uh, throughout America. The, the blight went through and people just started killing them off so that none of them would get blight or they wouldn't spread was the idea. And so those that are left over are extremely valuable because they were resistant. Uh, all right. And in your laneways, are you already planning laneways in between these swales in case in the future you do want to uh, raise crops on them? Uh, no, no. Our, our land is too hilly to, to really do. Um, I mean, I guess you could potentially do some, uh, some, some sort of semi-permanent or perennial, you know, maybe asparagus or something like that. Although asparagus wouldn't do well in this soil. Um, but no, the plan is, is really not. Really the, the idea is to have a um, pasture land with, with trees dotted throughout um, for wind and shade and uh, leaf drop and food um, and all kind of all the benefits that you get from the trees and what they produce. Um, but not really for other crops that are going to be running underneath it. All right. We have time for one more question, guys. So I'm going to take Ashley's question. Ashley asks, could you please tell us about your time management, balancing the ER job with farm needs? How often do you have a farm issue that needs to be addressed now, just as you're called into the ER, things like that? Yeah, that is a really great question. We had one of the workers here today said, how in the world do you do you work, you know, these 12 hour ER shifts doing three days in a row. And then you come here and you're working all day long in the farm. Like, do you ever take a break? And the, the reality is, is that, you know, I, I, I wrote this article and you can, you can find it on, on my website about the myth of the perfect job. Um, the idea 
that, you know, there, you have to have management, you have to have balance in what you're doing. And for me, um, the only thing that I struggle with is making sure that I have enough time for my family. I love working as a physician. I love all my time that I work here on the farm. And, um, and what we really try to do, we homeschool our kids. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But um, a big one is that with my schedule being very unpredictable in the ER and on the farm, there's no like, oh, they're, it's the weekday, they can't be there. We go out there and they're out there with doing everything that we're doing. And so if I'm home working on the farm, most of the time I have one or two kids with me doing something um, here. And so it is constantly a balance. If we did not have the woofers and we had a period of about two weeks where um, one woofer kind of fell through and we didn't have somebody that was helping us, um, we got very overwhelmed and we're like, oh my goodness, what are we doing? Um, my wife is fantastic. She has never had a desire to be, to live on a farm and she has jumped in on this um, with both feet and does way more than I ever expected and has made this um, not just possible, but um, has let us thrive in this. And so it is constantly, and we also have family family meetings on a regular basis. Um, and it's not just for my wife and I, but my folks who also live here. And depending on what the meeting is about, we'll bring the woofers in too to get their, their ideas. Because we got some, you know, we've had a PhD in microbiology here. We've got engineers who come here to woof with us. We've got chess teachers that come to woof with us. You know, I mean, I, I'm blown away at the, the the people who want to come here and see what I'm doing, and I find out what they're doing, and I'm like, you know, you're a really, really smart person, um, and they're just looking for the experience that I was doing. You know, I was doing the exact same thing, um, and so there's constant feedback, constant reevaluation, and constantly trying to make sure that what we're doing is sustainable, and is meeting our goals as a family to move forward because it's very easy to get burned out if you don't manage your time well. Yeah. And I think the, and the big part of it in especially working with animals and especially in the way you work with the animals and in, in, uh, pasturing them and, and rotating them, you get, it's like a, like an entrepreneur that's doing, starting his own business. The time flies by and you, because you're, you really love what you're doing especially if it's something where you're interacting with those animals, you're moving them every, every day, or you're doing something with them. I think that brings a lot of uh, joy that you normally wouldn't have and it. And it helps the, with the, uh, the time go by, it, you know, you wake up at five, six in the morning and all of a sudden it's 7 PM. Yeah. yeah. I, I tell my wife constantly, I, I have too few lives for all the things I want to get done. And so I have to always figure out what it is I'm doing. Uh, or make sure that what I'm doing every day um, is is in line with the overall role. Uh, we don't have a T. I haven't had a TV since we lived overseas, um, which was a huge. I mean, that saved. I'm so thankful for that. Um, and now it's. I can't even imagine if I had a TV. I, I, you know, getting sucked into that would be would be detrimental to everything here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad I got rid of the TV too. <laughs> Uh, tcpermaculture.com guys that's where you want to go to check out John's articles and get on his mailing list uh, anything else you want to plug John before we take off uh, not really no I just uh, I love what you guys are doing uh, with Perma Ethos so thank you for this uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity and uh, thank you everybody for tuning in I um, had a really good time all right thank you for being with us we really enjoyed it I really enjoyed it and it was a great conversation Thank you, everybody. Until next time, we'll see you. You can head over to tv.permethos.com and register for future, uh, future presentations. Thanks again, John. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.